Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this Royal Society of Edinburgh webinar on social prescribing for mental health. My name is uh, John Gillis. I worked in Africa and was a rural general practitioner in Scotland for most of my life. I'm now, I now do some academic work with the Usher Institute at the University of Edinburgh, and I'm delighted to chair this webinar. My perspective on social prescribing uh, started when I chaired a steering group for the first Scottish government funded project on community links workers in general practice some years ago. And that's now being rolled out across all general practices in Scotland. And part of my thinking about it is that um, social prescribing is a complementary approach to the paradigm of pharmacologically based um, biomedicine and treatments for mental health that has prevailed for some, a, for some decades. The slide you see before you now is a social prescribing pathway, which is generally one which is used when, when uh, the social prescribing is done through the medium of the GP or the general practice and individual comp with complex needs visits a practice, the GP will refer, assesses the need, and then there are pathways to different um, interventions, learning and skills, employment support, and perhaps what we're talking about most today is activities to build social confidence, social networks, and well-being. So social providing, prescribing provides the link between people and communities a, which are accessible to them to help improve quality of life. The Royal Society of Edinburgh is Scotland's national academy. Our motto is knowledge made useful, and I think that's exemplified by this session today. Uh, it comprises a fellowship of people from science and technology backgrounds, arts and humanities, social sciences, business, and a uh, public health. The format of the event is that we have three distinguished speakers who will offer complementary uh, perspectives on social prescribing. Uh, they will speak for uh, a short time and we will leave time for questions. Questions should be um, uh, sent to us via the Q&A box on the bottom uh, right of your screen. We won't be using the chat function in this webinar. So we will take questions after all three speakers have spoken. Um, but a, we will um, start. We will combine the questions and have them at the end of the uh, at the end of the speakers. So uh, I'm delighted to a, to welcome our first speaker. Um, I think we'll probably a, to give Stella, who's just arrived, a chance to settle in. We'll start with uh, with uh, Ruthann Baxter. Ruthann, would you like to? introduce yourself and we have an additional guest speaker as well as you can see from the screen welcome good morning everybody and um, i hope you can hear me well enough um, i'm ruthann baxter i am the civic engagement manager for the heritage collections at the university of edinburgh and um, i'm going to just take the next five minutes to give you a very brief overview of prescribed culture which is um, our uh, heritage-based non-clinical support for health, social care, and well-being. So hopefully you can see my screen. Um, but at the moment, this is the prescribed culture offer. Just a very quick background. So prescribed culture was started um, in 2018. So it's pre-COVID and it was really started um, uh, to support students at the University of Edinburgh who were um, struggling with um, mental health. And it started with a stat, as some of these things do. Um, and in the previous academic year, um, it had become clear that the demand on the university's counselling services had grown significantly. So I had become aware of social prescribing, and I thought, well, if it works for other communities, could it work for the student community? Um, anyway, that was way back in uh, uh, 2018, and um, this is what it looks like today. So we have an online offer, and we have an in-person offer. So very quickly, um, Take 30 Together Virtual is essentially our um, online social prescribing um, for people who are 18 and over who are seeking support mostly for um, mild anxiety or loneliness and sort of a sense of disconnect. 
Um, so we uh, offer the opportunity to um, weekly escape, explore and e-socialize with the World of Heritage. So that's a self-referral program. And um, the one in the middle, Program 6, is more of an early intervention. And uh, from the beginning, it was um, available to um, students uh, just at the University of Edinburgh, but now we open it up to all students who are studying at universities in the city of Edinburgh. But also later this year, we're going to try it up in the Highlands, and I'll speak about that in a little minute. But essentially, Program 6 is small group, maximum 10 people. It's um, 90 minute workshops uh, for six weeks in a row, and they're all heritage based. Um, and they're basically a format of 20 minutes of exploring an object, an archive, or a heritage building. Then the essential tea and coffee to just chat and relax. And then a 45 minutes of an on, on hands on activity. Um, but that's closed and referral only. And then the last one is our unlock and revive, and that is social prescribing online for those living with dementia and other brain related conditions. So if I can move on. Um, on campus here in Edinburgh, uh, because obviously I take advantage really of the fact that I work in um, the museum sector in a university setting. Um, not only do we have a, a social prescribing in delivery, and I think um, Edinburgh University is certainly one of the first, if not the first university in the world to offer on-campus social prescribing. And um, so all of our staff and students can um, benefit from the three programmes that I've just mentioned. But furthering into that, um, Prescribed Culture is now involved in the teaching and learning at the university. I work really closely with um, Helen Eberl, who is our senior lecturer in critical public health. And last year um, took part in some of the tutorials in the um, social and ethics in medicine course. Um, going, looking forward to the academic year ahead, um, we're going to provide some uh, prescribed culture creative placements for students who are studying um, some of the health and social care courses and also for the Percy group. Again, I'll speak about that briefly in a minute. And um, also working to bring well-being into the curriculum at the university, irrespective of what you're there to study, um, you will have an option to um, just do a little bit more learning about what's really psychosocial health care management. And also involved in research clusters, um, the Inter Edinburgh Interdisciplinary Mental Health Research Group and the Student Mental Health Research Cluster. And if anybody on the um, event today is interested, um, it is the Thrive Network, which is very much looking at thriving in a university um, community, then please do join the um, Edinburgh Futures Institute uh, network there. Research is also a really important part of what I'm doing, and I really think that the research and the, and the practical, the delivery um, and development all goes hand in hand, and it sort of starts and ends with research in my world. So um, involved uh, out with Edinburgh, I am a co-investigator on the You Flourish project with the University um, Queens in Canada with Professor Anne Duffy. And a part, as part of that, um, I was a co-author on a student mental health literacy course where obviously I have done my best to um, raise awareness of social prescribing. The other one is, which was mentioned earlier, um, I'm a co-investigator with Sarah Bradley and Sarah, uh, Sarah Ann Manoes up at the University of Highlands and Islands Rural Health School. And we are looking at prescribed heritage highlands. So the idea there is it's a scalability um, research project. And we're basically seeing if the um, program six and take home together virtual can work in a more remote and rural area where a lot of the cultural and heritage offer is managed by volunteers. Um, I'm doing some consultancy and mentoring um, in other parts of the world. So um, again, some mentoring with a student in Canada and working very closely with the National Museums in Portugal and the University of Lisbon um, and hopefully developing a museums in social prescribing um, training course there, which hopefully will be available at the beginning of 2023. Um, I always think that if you're going to get involved in social prescribing, get very active, get proactive and get part of the community. So there are lots of opportunities to do this, but just two that I'll highlight this morning is the Percy Network. So that stands for Personalised um, Care Interprofessional Education Group and it's open to third sector and cultural organisations like museums and, and galleries um, to, that can offer creative health placements for students who are doing health and social care courses. Um, and also we've got the brilliant Scottish Social Prescribing Network. Um, obviously, I'm not biased, I am on the steering group, but it is a wonderful um, opportunity to bring people together who are working in social prescribing in any level and any way across Scotland. So again, please do jump on and get involved. And that's me. 
Thank you very much, uh, Ruthann, for uh, Whistle Talk two, two of what is actually a great deal of uh, activity, a uh, practical and research based on, on social prescribing. If you, if, for those of you who haven't seen it, if you look at the latest uh, issue of Resource, the uh, RSE magazine, there's a short piece written by a, myself and Ruthann on um, social prescribing, and also some really interesting other articles as well about data and mental health, and architecture and mental health. So I would recommend it. I think it's available via the RSE website. So um, I think we'll move on now. Um, I think Stella and her co-speakers seem to have disappeared off the call temporarily. Um, so I can conjecture there might be some necessary things going on in this Chan household. I wonder if we could move on therefore to uh, Janet Smythe, who's going to give a perspective on the arts and mental health. Uh, Janet, would you like to introduce yourself and speak? Uh, thank you. Oh, thanks, John. Um, I hope Stella's okay. Uh, I can imagine it's very busy in her household. Uh, thank you so much, Ruthann. Hello, everyone. My name is Janet Smith, and I'm actually speaking to you from Toronto, so I'm five hours behind, so the sun is still to rise, hence why I'm slightly in the gloom here. Um, my uh, my roles have uh, always been in terms of uh, the arts side of any activities. So I have absolutely no qualifications at all when it comes to um, mental health or uh, medicine or psychology. So I'm very much embedded in the world of arts programming and arts uh, project management. Um, I kind of came into the world of what we now refer to as social prescribing on two projects when I worked at the Edinburgh International Book Festival and I was there for nine years and I left back in 2019. Uh, and it was a really interesting time um, because we were just in terms of the, the, the world of arts and culture and well-being, beginning to look at this idea of the role of arts in helping particularly those people who have uh, mental ill health. And um, one of the, the big projects that we were involved with um, was a very uh, multidisciplinary, so there was a lot of agencies involved in that project. Uh, but bringing it together was um, quite challenging in terms of us as the arts partner. Um, and partly because it was ensuring that as the arts organization, what we were creating was meaningful and robust for participants. And so looking for that framework to, to, to use to structure and to scaffold the project was quite key when thinking about how we might develop it uh, for those who were going to be taking part within it. And so I had looked at the NHS Scotland guidance on social prescribing that had been published back in 2016. And I've kind of highlighted some of the things that um, I think this conversation is, is really uh, supportive in looking at. So things like there's good theoretical basis for social prescribing, which I think is quite interesting because we all, as John has explained, agree that um, if you have mental ill health and participation and, and, and connection and getting out is really, really important. Um, so we all know it works, but the evidence of effectiveness is still developing. So that was one of the key things when we were looking at developing the project. How do we find that evidence? How do we find that base that this works? Um, and of course, there is a range of different models. And so we were looking at different um, projects, different um, interventions, both in the UK and, and further field um, and we also thought about how to create good quality evaluation when the projects had come to come to an end um, but the key things I think as an arts organization heading down the road of thinking of social prescribing then the interventions have to be effective for the participants and you have to think carefully about the context in which those interventions are taking place so all of these different things were, were at play when we began to think about the project. So for me, and this goes beyond the, the specifics of what I'll describe in a moment, there are core aspects to any arts intervention 
when heading into the field of especially mental health. So as the arts organization, you really have to think about working together for the participants. And that is through the relevant partnerships. And I really stress relevant partnerships. And also it's about the participants themselves and what's going to work for them. Uh, it's about the respect and the dignity that you therefore give to those who are taking part in any kind of project or activity or um, pres prescription for want of a better word. Um, and understanding their, their needs, because as John said at the beginning, this is complementary to any pharmacological interventions that have already preceded the activity that, that you may be thinking about developing as the arts organisation. And you have to be committed. This isn't something that can happen over the course of a couple of weeks. As Ruthann has already described, this is about planning, it's about delivery, it's about longevity, and it's about defining the outcomes um, for those who are, who are processing through um, whatever activities it is that you're developing for people. Um, it's very much about compassion as well, and, and that is a word that we bandy around a lot, but actually, compassion takes a lot of energy and a lot of commitment and it can be very challenging sometimes especially in the sphere of working with people with mental ill health and um, people will um will disappear from activities for a little while um from week to week or day to day their moods will be different um they'll challenge you on what it is they're doing and why they're doing it and what they'll they'll get from it so 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 be prepared and if you're working with artists in this kind of sphere that they too understand the level of commitment that they will have to make in order to kind of participate and create something that that has has worth and meaning for those taking part and obviously it's about improving lives and it's about everyone who participates counts regardless of whether they're very vocal and active or quite passive and um and 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 shy about participating and for those of you who perhaps are from a medical background you'll recognize those um core aspects because they're also core to our NHS that's that's what it's built upon as well and I think that's really important that recognition of the medical side and how it uh, talks to the art side and that the two have to have the same aims um, as as again John said it's about complementary so the project that um, we developed I'm going to skip that one because I'm conscious of timing but the one that I really want to talk to you about, because it is very much about mental health, um, the project was called Conversations with Ourselves. And it was created with um, people who are voice hearers. And voice hearing is something that around 15% of the population uh, live with. So that's multiple consciousness within, uh, within ourselves. And... Um, it can be quite stigmatized because often we think about people who hear voices who then, you know, murder people or, or go, go mad and are violent. But actually, uh, that is a, a tiny, tiny minority of those who, who experience this. Um, but what we were asked to do as the arts organization was use as a book festival the idea of storytelling um to explore the voices that people hear and that was to make meaning of what they experience and a lot of it was about the making meaning in order to understand their condition because quite often when it got out of control that's when psychotic or psychosis would would begin so it was about supporting people before they became very ill, but still working with people who were quite acute. So they were already very embedded within the health service. Um, and it was also for them about giving them a platform as a book festival to talk to us, the general public, about the condition and to destigmatize it. So that it was part of the process was about them educating those who didn't understand what voice hearing was like. And we did that working with them in a number of ways. Um, so there were artists and writers 
who, who work together in order to develop that idea of how you share and tell your own story. Um, we developed a series of different events at the Edinburgh International Book Festival that, that looked at voice hearing um, in terms of how writers hear the voices of their characters, in terms of um, childhood friends, uh, invisible friends. That's all about voice hearing as well. Um, and also how we view voice hearing in other cultures. So uh, looking at it through anthropology, looking at it through religion. So the, the whole idea of voice hearing, when you actually really begin to explore it, is is very embedded in our culture and our society and western culture and and others and so it was all about that kind of beginning to tell those stories and beginning to understand them and as the arts organization how we did that with the professional artists and how we gave a platform in a in a in a public setting in order to explore that on a wider wider scale we were massively lucky to be working with durham university and with the multiple departments within that university but as part of that partnership we also got a PhD student who did a lot of the research around it, which goes back to what Ruthann was saying. Research uh, is very important. Evaluation is very important. And uh, yeah, we were massively fortunate in that Durham were our partner and we had that, that as part of that, that work with them. Um, we had very spe specified outcomes and that was coming from the participants themselves. And a key to that was an establishment of a network of self-help groups where people could come together, share their experiences and support one another. Uh, and that kind of went beyond the patients themselves. Or I, don't, I don't really want to say the word patients, um, uh, the, the participants themselves as well as their family, as well as their friends. Um, and of course, the funding as an arts organization, uh, anyone out there who works with the arts knows that funding is an endless challenge for us all. But we worked with the Wellcome Trust and had uh, funding from them. And Durham University also applied for funding, but from a different pot. So we applied as an engagement organization. And they, of course, applied as an academic research organization, which kind of increased the pot of money that was available to us all. And we shared all of the research. We shared it in a public forum through the Guardian newspaper, and we shared it through academic and research forums via the team at Durham University that we were working with, who of course took it to conferences and fed it into um, peer reviews, uh, all, all of that side of things as well. Um, so it was a big piece of work, and the planning and the delivery were very key. Thinking about the outcomes was, was key as, as, as well. And sh being able to share a lot of that uh, was a very important part of how we shaped and thought about the work. Um, but at the end of the day, um, I think what this project and what other projects that I've been involved in, in come down to is the three C's, which are about connection, so people coming together um, and being able to share experience and to feel heard. I think that's a really important part, and, it, and I think that's a lot of what Ruth Ann described as well for the students. It's about control, and I think control is really important within the health sector. Um, I don't know how many of you have been at your GP for something and just had no, no idea potentially how to describe how you felt. Uh, far less understand what your diagnosis or treatment might look like. Um, so that control over how to articulate a health sensation um, and also an insight into their own health and the 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 um, the, the ups and downs of it, because that's the other thing with with uh, a lot of people at the acute end of mental health services. That's the chances are that is something that they will live with for life. So giving that sense of how you control it, how you understand it, and uh, the expectations that you have of, of living with uh, mental ill health. And then of course, there's confidence. Um, the, it, it's, it's very difficult, especially um, for, for people who perhaps are voice hearers, to feel confident about being out in public spaces. Uh, sometimes they're in conversation, literally with the voices and and are very aware that other people will look at them or will um subconsciously judge them in some way or be afraid of them and so so giving them the confidence to be out in public sphere and to acknowledge that that's who they are 
that those voices are part of them and, and part of the meaning of who they are. Um, so that was a kind of whistle stop tour of uh, one of the projects that uh, looked at how you work with participants, but use the arts and culture and the space of arts and culture within our society in order to explore and um, offer, offer that uh, intervention, that uh, complementary uh, prescription to the pharmacological side. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Janet, for presenting quite a complex project in a, in a way that uh, was easy for those not involved in it to, to, uh, to understand. And the important thing seemed to me is, first of all, having an unconditional regard for the person in front of you, whoever that is and whoever he or she is. And I was really interested in that, the way that you described the destigmatizing of the of the experience via exploration and storytelling and explanation. I think there's a great deal to unpack there. In my tradition, the Scottish Gaelic tradition, there's a lot of Beale Irish uh, oral tradition about voices, hearing voices and sounds, which at one time were regarded as part of normal experience, but in a way have now been stigmatized. So there's interesting anthropological angles, as you say. However, this is not about my experiences. Stella, welcome, uh, welcome back. Uh, I'm sorry you've lost your co-speaker, have you? But uh, you're welcome to reintroduce her if you feel she would help with the, with the programme. So delighted to hear from you. If you can just give a little bit of background about yourself and then, uh, and then tell us about uh, Project Sooth. Yes. Um, hi, um, my name is Stella Chen. I'm the Charlie Waller Professor um, in Evidence-Based Psychological Treatment at the University of Reading. Uh, formerly, I was at the University of Edinburgh and has been working um, with Janet, actually, in, when Janet was at the International Book Festival, Edinburgh International Book Festival, and has been engaged with uh, the Curious Series for a few years now in the TN Talk uh, series as well. So um, I want to tell you just a just like Janet and Ruth, I just kind of want to give you a, a very quick overview of some of our work, um, just to kick off the discussion, really. So I'm trying to share my screen. Can people see my, um, yeah, good, great. Yeah, Thank you, yeah. Janet. So just to, um, just to give, um, yeah, just to give people a little bit of transition from Janet, this photograph was taken at the Edinburgh International Book Festival in the first year when I collaborated with Janet and her team, fabulous team. Um, so um, that year, a few years back now, so that was before my first daughter, so it must have been at least five years ago. So we had the Writing for Resilience workshop, and we have a youth mental health panel discussion, and over years, just last year, uh, we had another event for Project Suv, and uh, over years, I've been helping um, to chair mental health uh, uh, events as well. As Jenna say, I think one of the value around social prescribing, around using art and culture, is part of the, the stigmatizing process. It's about the more we talk about that, the more we know it's okay to talk about that and to normalize the experience. Um, so I just want to tell a little bit uh, more about our setup, you know, here at Reading, we uh, work very closely with NHS services. And for example, recently we have introduced new routine clinical measures on lifestyle factors. That also kind of, it's not a social prescribing movement, but it's a wider recognition that our lifestyle factors matter for mental health. So we started asking service users around what they eat, how they sleep, the physical um, activity level. It's in recognition that mental health is not just about how your brain works and what your thinking process is, it's more about how you live your life as well. So that actually key into the whole principle about a holistic approach of understanding health and mental health. Um, so Podic Soothe um, started seven years ago now, um, it is a fundamentally a photograph collection uh, effort. Um, so if you go to our website, www.projectsoof.com, you get, you know, a, a lot of information about us, all the videos I mentioned, et cetera. And we have been fortunate enough to receive funding from various bodies and more recently Wellcome Trust and previously British Academy, Leavenham Trust and ESRC. So just say, want to say thank you to them and uh, Jessman Foundation. So um, it comes from compassion focused therapy. So it is a therapy that, kind of feature um, three emotional systems about 
um, one is about drive, like when you feel you've done really well, you know, if you're on top of the world, um, not not exactly on top, but you feel really great about yourself, very proud of yourself. So it's a kind of something to drive you forward. Threat sounds bad, but it's actually necessary because if we don't have any fear and anxiety, we ended up like jump, jumping into river and, and doing all sorts of reckless things. So, um, but the third system is a system that we tend to overlook. It's a soothe system. It's feel, feeling safe and connected and content. So a good mental health, according to this therapy, is around having a good uh, balance between the three systems. And often we overlook soothe, as I say. So we either kind of going really excited and driving ourselves forward, keeping ourselves really busy or fe feeling under threat. And um, But if we don't have enough soothe to unwind and relax, then we end up like feeling, you know, we are more likely to feel stressed and anxious and um, uh, burn out. So the inspiration also come from my father. That's my father. Who, who, he was a fireman, but his part time job is also amateur photographer and semi professional. Uh, uh, so he, he kind of go around and help taking photographs of various things, sometimes fire scene as well, <laughs> when he gather evidence and so. So I grew up with photographs in the 1980s, so kind of manual um, uh, cameras and stuff, and I uh, always have an interest. In, in photograph. And when I work with the Bring Rehabilitation um, uh, Surface in Ely, in Cambridgeshire, near Cambridge, uh, we observed that actually um, uh, photograph could be a really good way to help people connect with their emotion because traditionally a lot of therapy use mental imagery. So it rely a great deal on people being able to imagine something in their head, but some people just can't. So we started using photograph clinically uh, but rather informally. So after some years, I thought maybe it is of value to create a bank of soothing images that therapists can use or researchers can use or people like Ruth or Janet in their work, you know, everyone can use, charity can use. So we've collected photographs and we've so far collected over 800 photographs from more than 40 countries. And these were rated as most soothing by the general public. And the, you know, the biggest themes are landscape, water feature, flowers, animals, um, sky, etc. And our research showed that if you look at 25 of them randomly selected from the whole collection, people would immediately improve immediately. But what we don't know is whether there are any long term benefits, because just because you feel better after seeing something immediately doesn't mean that necessarily mean that you have a longer term benefit. So that is something we're still doing research to look into, but it looks promising to us. Over years, a lot of students have been helping us to look at different ways to boost the, the health benefits of photographs. And more recently, we found that the music we tried to add didn't really help, but maybe we got the wrong music or the wrong um, soundtracks. But what it does seem help is some kind of mindfulness practice in combination with photographs. So we're still doing more research to look into that. Um, we look at qualitative research. We do interviews with people. We collect a lot of narratives. And what we found is that, you know, when people say they feel soothed, they can soothe themselves, but sometimes they feel being soothed by other things or other objects. And also often linked with physical sensations like touch, smell, sound. So it seems like a multimedia approach, different engaged with different senses could be very useful. So we've started working with the Autism Center here at the University of Reading to look into the application for people who have neurodiversity, autism, um, uh, that kind of uh, neurodevelopmental uh, difficulties. Again, it's about feeling calm, relaxed and, and at ease and people find the concept really easy to understand. Also being in familiar environment, being connected with nature. So again, connection with nature come up really important in our line of work. Um, so another student looking at photograph that people find soothing versus not soothing and find that again, nature related has been always considered as soothing and something that artificial like urban setting consider less soothing, et cetera. So I won't go into details just to kind of highlight that these are the, some of the research we've done. It often linked with our memory. So the memory of last time we got on holiday that was a soothing holiday or we went to holiday it was really hectic so sometimes somehow really link up with our personal memory again our sensory experience etc and sometimes link with our value and our moral principle as well and but there are also individual differences for example this photograph for me is very soothing you know I like swimming and this is amazing big sky and so a lot of people love it but actually some people look at those two little dots there and saw the people that swimming and find that really 
threatening because they look as though they may drown. So one photograph soothing for us may not be soothing for others. And I think that cut across the theme of social prescribing. What is this so nice about the idea is that it can it is quite a flexible approach that help us map onto individual needs and being able to map onto an individual needs is really important. We work very closely with young people. They give us a lot of suggestions. And since then we have uh, taken up many of these suggestions and test them out in our laboratory. We work with poet to transform our images into a poem because some people don't like images. They may like um, words. Um, that is kind of through Janet's team effort that we were working uh, uh, with a poet at the book festival to transform our uh, data, research data into a poem. And you can and watch the video in our website. We, again, uh, because of the connection with nature, we work with Royal uh, Botanic Garden Edinburgh. We had a big exhibition there a few years back. Uh, involving a lot of um, uh, very nice uh, activities for children and all ages. Um, we work with a lot of organizations, including like National Trust and many charities. And together uh, we have tested out our photograph in different settings for their well-being strategy. And we put them together in a series of case studies. And you can download Project Soothe Pioneers and Practice User Guide freely downloadable from our website. We have launched an app during COVID, similar to Ruth. Uh, we're thinking about the com elderly community during the first lockdown. So that is, again, a free app um, uh, uh, feature that you can download and try out uh, within CogniCare, which is an app. Um, more recently, we work with young people, over 200 children, young people were engaged with them, and 70 of them we work very closely over the course of a year, a whole year, and to create a lot of well-being tools using the photographs. I won't go into details, but that involve um, a website, a book, a graphic novel, pencil case, um, slideshows, videos, uh, pair up with Harry Potter quotes and this one really interesting is this group of young people in their school has set up this black tent and inside that young people can go in to watch Project Soothe uh, videos and photographs during their recess time lunch break so that's they sell this called mini soothing cinema within their school so that's really interesting because they think that it helped them relax and between lessons and so I won't go into detail but these are just some of the feedback and last year, as I said, that we work with the book festival and to discuss this um, project and the, the importance of well-being and resilience, which was generously sponsored by the Jasmine Foundation. Um, we're just doing more research at the moment to see if we can make use of virtual reality, gamification, can we test out in different populations, etc. And we work with Boys in Mind, which is a charity that uses films to uh, bring awareness of well-being and mental health. And we got a really lovely video with a primary school uh, co-produced with uh, young um, filmmakers in primary school back down from four year old to, um, to 11. Uh, and since then we have expanded into three more schools in the local area. Uh, we're at the moment also working on a rucksack idea, trying to provide um, resilience rucksack for teenagers in the transition between primary and secondary schools in which they can go to our resilience fair. So it's like a fun fair, but a well-being theme that they can talk to researchers about different evidence base and different well-being tools. They can pick them and put them into a resilience rucksack for use. Um, so this is just a really quick overview. I appreciate it. it's very quick, um, but happy to uh, send links and uh, 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 to video and stuff afterwards by email or in a chat box. So thank you. Thank you very much, Stella. And that was uh, another fascinating presentation, another another way of approaching well-being through for, for, through photographs. And what an amazingly well-developed program uh, you have. Congratulations. So now we move on to the second stage of our uh, webinar, which is a question and answers, and we have plenty of uh, questions. I, just before we move on to that, I, can, I, I was interested to see you mention poetry as well, Stella, and you would involved Ron Butland, the Edinburgh poet, in, uh, in, in your programme. I just wanted to mention the one thing that we have. This is um, Tools of the Trade, which is an anthology of poems which we gift to young doctors, new doctors who graduate in Scotland every year. And uh, it's, uh, it's a gift on, on behalf of uh, 
uh, the profession to the new members of the profession. It's also available for the public, published by Scottish Poetry Library and Polygon Press. New edition this year is a really interesting selection. So if you're interested, please buy. It helps us, it helps us to gift it to new doctors. So we'll move on to uh, questions and answers. Um, and I'll take a question first from uh, Sarah Jane Munas, uh, Professor of Rural Health at uh, University of the Highlands and Islands. Uh, Ruth Ann, you mentioned social prescribing work in, social, in Spain and Portugal. Are there any similarities or differences with social prescribing in Scotland that you could reflect on and perhaps use for moving us forward? Um, so that's a really good question. Uh, the simple answer is that it's just really different. Um, Portugal and Spain are incredibly new to social prescribing. Um, so I would suggest that um, Scotland is slightly ahead of them. Um, what I've discovered with the people that I'm working with there is certainly it's very new to the cultural sector um, and it's happening very much at grassroots levels. So um, unlike in Scotland, we do have the brilliant uh, community link workers. Mm. They are, um, there's a few in roles a little bit like that. They just call them social prescribers, but they're not that many. So it still very much sits with the GPs to be enlightened and to do those links for themselves. One of the other key differences in um, the museum uh, that I'm working with in Lisbon and the university there and the um, community health centres that they are working with, those health centres have 94 different nationalities in their patient enrolment. So that's not quite what I'm working with in Edinburgh. So yeah, there are there are differences, but like everything that's around social prescribing, it's very much about the place that you're geographically working in, um, and obviously the differences required to serve them. Mm, thank you. And just a, a, while you're on the microphone, uh, um, a Paula Watkinson has asked, um, do you get many attendees? What's your, what sort of atten attendances do you get for your programmes? So um, there's it's different depending on the programme that we're on, but so for the moment, uh, Take Turn Together Virtual gets usually on average about 25 people jumping on every week. Um, the programme sixes are very specifically small group. So um, the reason that they are uh, closed referral uh, by referral only is because there's a safeguarding element there mm. um, and many of the students that we are working with um, it's because of mental health issues that they are being referred in so for many of them it's social anxiety could be an issue so it's really sort of taking care of them and what what most of them have in common um, is uh, like just a sense of disconnect and isolation um, and I, I did notice in, in the um, questions as well there was a question about different cultures and different mm. they don't really recognize uh, mental health as a, a health condition um, but certainly with prescribed culture at the University of Edinburgh we've got a very international student base and actually genuinely to, to surprise of nearly all of us internally we actually have quite a few um, students from China and from India access and prescribed culture. Mainly, I think one of the very simplistic reasons is because the title doesn't have any reference to therapy or counseling or mental health in, in sort of the headline, if you like, um, and uh, they, they find it really easy to access. So um, we sort of by default have been able to make it quite international and intercultural in its, um, in its benefiters. Mm. Thank you. We could, we could maybe that's the question that Charlotte uh, Clegg uh, has posed. I wonder if um, uh, do you want me to read it out again, Janet and uh, Stella? Can you see it? Uh, how, she's asked, how do we best utilize social prescribing across cultural differences, e.g., those from collectivist backgrounds or those where mental health is seen as either taboo or, or originating from spiritual deficiencies may not engage with these programs in the same way that more individualistic, atheistic cultures, perhaps like ours, would. So I wondered if you had any experience of that or any comments on the on the issue. Hey, Janet, do you want to comment first? Uh, yeah, that's a really interesting question. And actually living in Toronto now, which is a massively diverse city. I think over 52% of the population have come from other places. Um, that that is a, a big issue. Um, I I think in terms of an arts organisation, because um, 
we we are the the the, the medicine for want of a better term then it's about that idea of being open and compassionate and being ready to listen how how you you make the step from whatever um, pharmacological services that you're coming from i i I wouldn't know that process or how to do it, but the the groups and the people that I've experienced of working with are usually coming from settings where they are in a, a process towards participating in this kind of activity. So for example, with the, the voice hearing community, they were already within, very embedded within the medical system. And as part of that process, they were uh, in clinical sessions with psychologists, with psychoanalysts, who then understood what was going on within the kind of research community in terms of where to send people to. So, so we were very much part of uh, a long, a long path towards what ultimately was being a part of this creation of this body of work and this creative process. I also worked with the British Lung Foundation and the Proteus Project at Enbury University, which is a big research project into lung conditions. And the people that we worked with there were from all sorts of uh, backgrounds and cultures and um, heritage. Um, and they were really interesting because they were a, a groups of people who were going usually on a weekly basis into Enbury University for uh, support with their lung conditions. So a lot of them had things like COPD or um, very specified lung disease like lung cancer. Um, and so they were already kind of meeting each other within these usually within waiting rooms and so we were asked uh, if we would work with them in order to vocalize and work through the sensations that they had in order to articulate that for better diagnosis um, and a lot of the people that did participate in that particular piece of work were coming to us because they had poor mental health as a result of their physical ill health. Um, and that was from many cultures. So that was quite interesting because their diagnosis was physical, not mental. But the reason why they were part of the project was because it was impacting on their mental ill health. So that was a little workaround almost to trick them into being part of the, the experience. Mm, interesting, interesting. Stella, I wonder if you had any reflections on the, that issue. Yes, um, so I kind of want to um, uh, want to want to kind of emphasize a few things about uh, accessibility. So I think one of the things for probably for all health, you know, physical and mental health, uh, we know that one of the obstacles is that people don't always come forward to seek help. Um, and when they seek help, they may or may not be able to get the help they need. So there's kind of multiple obstacles here, both in terms of the, whether the services are made accessible enough or whether people kind of feel they can assess them. Um, and some of those barriers are very subtle. So it's like some of the services, like it's open to all, but the way it's open, like the opening time or something, kind of uh, 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 immediately would actually um, make it difficult for some people to engage with. So talk about diversity. I think that is one really important thing going forward in health and mental health is the diversity, is how we cater for diversity and communities that are hard to reach, hard to reach from our point of view and for us to be hard to reach from their point of view. Um, for Project Sue, for example, you know, we talked about pro early on, I think John mentioned like cultural differences and so. Um, for Project Sue, we actually have extended into four lower and middle income countries. So we've done a kind of quick project of focus group to uh, uh, see the opinions and the base value of applying photographs in different kind of cultural settings. So we have run a um, focus group um, in Thailand if, uh, and, and with practitioner in Ethiopia India, uh, Thailand, and Belize. And what we found is that actually things like photograph is exactly uh, the sort of thing that can be quite universal because nowadays, you know, everyone uh, have a phone and actually lower middle income countries have a lot of phones as well. So that is a misunderstanding. We thought they don't. They actually do have a lot. Um, so 
photograph, for example, because it transcends languages and so. But there are subtle differences. For example, in Thailand, they say, no, no, we, we don't use any photograph with animals because it's disrespectful. It's go against their cultural sort of faith and, and, and belief. So we need to be mindful of cultural differences, but at the same time, don't let, don't over, don't overestimate cultural differences in the sense that there's lots of things that share in common. About um, collectivist culture, I think it depends on how you organize your activities because the, a lot of activity can be done as part of a sharing. Uh, social connection, social connectedness, we know is particularly important. So for Project Sue, one of the feedback we got is that um, the, the users of our app, they like to have the feature in which they can share photo with each other because that helped them connect with each other. That was particularly important during the lockdown. So I, I, I don't think it's necessarily uh, a difference between individualistic versus uh, collectivist culture. Um, uh, another thing I think is important to think about is work with uh, different groups, uh, different social groups. Um, uh, uh, or kind of faith groups, you know, you if you try to sell an idea into a group that you have little understanding, you're very unlikely to succeed because you're basically speaking a different language, even though you're actually speaking the same language, literally. Um, so working with people who understand the people you want to work with. And I think that's why we did that that way in both Project Suit Public Engagement Program is for the Palni in practice one I mentioned, is that we actually didn't design um, the program for them. We invite the, the organization we want to engage with into our workshop. We tell them the evidence base and about our work, the science behind it, and then we gave them free access to all our materials. And it's for them to come up with their own program to evaluate it, but we give them regular support and, and, and help. Um, so I think this way of working is particularly important for social prescribing. It's a genuine co-production, not that you're trying to um, give offer something to people and think that you try out that will work because it won't work that way. So it's co-production and per very participatory. So a, a question, another question is kind of related. Um, is there any evidence of social prescribing to support neurodivergent people, people with ADHD, ASD, dyslexia and so on, uh, which can lead to mental health issues through isolation, anxiety, depression, and so on. I wondered if any of you wanted to comment, if we can keep the comments brief, because as I thought, we're running out of time already. So, but I'm grateful for comments from uh, any of you here. Um, I can just quickly say that I know that uh, certainly some of the students who have accessed program six have come to it because of isolation, because of um, a an, an neurodivergent um, sort of condition. And, uh, but really at the point of access in program six, uh, they are there because of the manifestation of impacts of isolation in a way, irrespective of what has driven that isolation. Um, but some of them will choose to share uh, what their neurodivergent um, uh, condition is and others don't. And that's absolutely fine by us. We do not need to know um, details that they are not willing to share. That's not what it's about. Sure, thank you. Um, I think we'll just take another, uh, Justin, this, Justin Duncan from the Alliance has uh, put in a link to the pilot links worker programme, which as I mentioned is now embedded in deep end GP practices. So that's worth exploring for any of you who are, uh, who are interested in it. Um, Colleen Andrews has asked, is social prescribing generally used as an alternative to traditional mental health treatments and services, I meds, medication, CBT, counselling, or as a placeholder until the person can access mental health services. Um, Ruth Ann, do you want to comment on that? Uh, yeah, I think the quick answer is both, both and all. Um, uh, certainly, uh, I know that we have got, um, again, some uh, referrals who are on medication for their uh, mental health, and others are also accessing talking therapies of different sorts. Um, and, and some you know, do disclose that they've had years of therapy um, and they're just trying something different than you. So um, as I say, it's not um, a, a something to be instead of, but it's often in complementary with yeah. in my experience. Yeah, and a related question is uh, from Sharon Winters, how should, should, how should NHS referred patients be triaged to either psychiatrist, psychotherapist or 
SP. I'm not quite sure what SP stands for, but basically uh, onto some other pathway for mental health treatment. And uh, I wondered if you have your experience of that, uh, Ruthann. Um, I mean, I suppose I am not in the health role, um, and I would do. I would think that the actual diagnosis and the where to refer to next would be sitting with the um, community link worker or the GP yeah. or, or the primary care person. So sure. I'm afraid I'm probably not uh, in the right role to yeah. answer that one. Um, but we very much, certainly, I very much depend on the um, referral partner to make the right call on that. So. Um, that's that's where we the, again the collaboration is very important. Sure, I mean it might be an interesting area for some research. In fact, I think to find out the interrelationship between social prescribing and and uh, onward uh, referral. Um, we'll just we'll perhaps take one last question um, and then a move on. The Scottish Social Prescribing Network have um, have put in their their website. Um, a, and Daniel Roberts has asked about referral pathways, which can be different for different localities. I think we know about uh, the ones which Ruth Ann has set up, but she's explained. Uh, um, and uh, Stella, what, what kind of referral pathways do you have? Where do your where do your um, users come from? Um, I. Well, Project Soup at the moment is not in formal kind of social prescribing, so we work kind of informally with community groups. But from my experience of general kind of referral in NHS services, because we have a um, university-led kind of uh, service that uh, take NHS patients and so. Um, what I want to say is that across the country, there's a lot of differences in terms of how um, the referral work. So there's a lot of regional differences and different mm -hmm. health board um, and different NHS trusts will work differently. But I think ideally in a good referral system, you should have all the referral come in in a meeting or in a way that representative from different places, different pathway would all sit together so that they can discuss it. And also NHS function in a kind of step care model in which that when you have a referral come in, um, it, you know, the, the severity was was kind of assessed to see, you know, what sort of services would be suitable. And after you, you're offered the service and if you don't improve or if you need more, then it kind of step up to another level. So that kind of step care model um, should work and incorporate social prescribing, ideally. Thank you. I'm afraid I would like to thank uh, the RSE for hosting this uh, and uh, all three speakers and panellists for their talks and indeed their constructive response to, to questions. This has been the most, uh, the, the most highly subscribed uh, webinar of the whole series, in fact. We've had nearly 300 uh, um, people interested in joining. And I think it's been productive and useful. So uh, many thanks to to all of you, and thank you, Stella, for particularly for joining in with uh, uh, with your domestic challenges as well. It's been well worthwhile. So all the best, and many many thanks. <laughs>